hello students let us start with our next chapter of biology that is neural control and coordination so let us first try and understand what is the nervous system nervous system is a system which controls and coordinates all the activity of your body whether you are talking walking sleeping everything is controlled by the nervous system it also conducts and integrates the information and responds to the stimuli what is stimuli stimuli is the change in your surroundings so suppose you touch a hot object you immediately will move your hand away this is because of the nervous system the nervous system includes brain the spinal cord and various nerves it is made of specialized cells which are called neurons which transmit nerve impulses so neuron neuron is the structural and functional unit of the nervous system it ha it has three parts the cell body dendron and axon so these are the three parts the cell body these are the dendrites and this is the axon the cell body is also called as cyton and it contains the cytoplasm cell organelles and nisi's granule that is the granular body then we have the dendron these are the dendrites which are present these are basically short fibers that project out of the cell body their sub branches are called dendrites they transmit impulses towards the cell body so they will collect all the information and they will transmit it to the cell body. then we have the axon axon as you can see is very long because it has to transmit information away from the cell body the branching of axon is called axonite and each axonite ends with a bulb like structure which is called the synaptic knob as you can see here so there are three main types of neurons multipolar bipolar and unipolar multipolar neurons have one axon and two or more dendrons they are found in the cerebral cortex the bipolar ones have one axon and one dendron hence the name bipolar that is two they are generally found in the retina of the eye unipolar neurons have one axon only they are found in the embryonic stage so these axons they can be of two types myelinated axon and non myelinated axon myelinated axons are the ones which have myelin sheet covering them so this is an example of a myelinated axon it is enveloped with schwann cells which form the myelin sheet around the axon it is generally found in spinal and cranial nerves spinal nerves are the one which connect the brain to the spine and the cranial nerves are the one which originate from brain the white colored area formed of myelinated nerve fibers is called the white matter and the gaps between two adjacent myelin sheet are called the nodes of renwick as you can see here the blue region here between the myelinated portion is the nodes of renwick then we have the non myelinated axon so here schwann cells present are there but there is no myelin sheet present the gray colored area without the myelin sheet is called gray matter this is generally found in autonomous and somatic nervous systems now that we have understood the structure of a neuron let us understand how does brain transmit messages so the brain transmits messages in form of nerve impulses the impulse transmission is electrochemical and it has three steps first is maintenance of the resting membrane potential then action potential and then the propagation of this action potential so let us understand what happens in the first step the neural membrane contains various selectively permeable ion channels in a resting neuron resting neuron means right now the neuron is not conducting any impulse the axonal membrane is more permeable to potassium ions and it is impermeable to sodium ions also the membrane is impermeable to negative charge proteins in the exoplasm so because of this permeability and impermeability the concentration of potassium and a negatively charged protein in the exoplasm is high and concentration of sodium is low 
so the fluid outside of the exon contains low concentration of potassium and high concentration of sodium so this forms an ionic gradient or a concentration gradient because of the difference in the concentration so this is the resting membrane as you can see here outside will be positive and inside it will be negative so because of these ionic gradient have to be maintained properly so this is generally done by the pumps which are present here so these are called sodium potassium pumps so this sodium potassium pump will transport three sodium outwards for every two potassium which is taken inside the cell so because of this the outer surface will become positively charged and the inner ones will become negatively charged so now there is a charge difference that is now it has become polarized so the electrical potential difference across the resting plasma membrane is what is called as the resting potential now let us understand what is action potential when there is a stimulus that is when there is any change in the surrounding the membrane at site a becomes permeable to any plus ions so this causes a rapid influx that is rapid intake of the sodium and it will reverse the polarity which we saw during resting potential so now because of this impulse the outer side is negative inner positive so this is called depolarization so the electrical potential difference during depolarization across the plasma membrane is what we call as action potential this is what generates the impulse at sites ahead that is at d sites the outer membrane surface is what is positive and the inner one is negative as this will keep flowing the inner surface from site a to site b on the outer surface the current flows from site b to site a to complete the circuit so because of this the polarity of the thing will be reversed and action potential will be generated at site b that is the action potential at site a will now arrive at the site b and it will go ahead this sequence will keep repeating along the exon and this is how the impulse will be conducted so the rise in the permeability of sodium ion is extremely short lived it is quickly followed by a rise in the permeability of potassium ion permeability means now the membrane allows the ions to enter immediately the k plus diffuses outside the membrane and it restores the resting membrane thus the fiber becomes ready for further stimulation now let us understand what are what is the synaptic transmission of impulses so for this we need to understand what is synapse synapse is a functional junction between two neuron it is basically the space between two neuron so it is of two types electrical and chemical synapse electrical synapse is where the membrane of pre and post synaptic neuron is in close proximity so the impulse transmission is similar to transmission along an exon your impulse transmission is faster than in chemical impulse and these are very rare in the human system then we have the chemical synapse in this there is fluid filled space that is synaptic cleft between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron so the presynaptic regions have swellings called as synaptic knob buttons they contain the synaptic vesicles which are filled with neurotransmitters that is acetylcholine or adrenaline and the messages go through these chemicals so what happens is once the impulse reaches the exon terminal the synaptic vesicle bind on the plasma membrane and they release the neurotransmitter this neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft and it will combine with the receptor on the postsynaptic membrane opening of the ion channels will occur this will allow the entry of the ion and this will generate the action potential this may be excitatory or inhibitory now let us understand the division of the human nervous system or the human neural system so it is basically divided into two parts these parts are the central nervous system that is cns and the peripheral nervous system 
that is PNS. So the central nervous system will include the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system will include the somatic neural system and the autonomic neural system. So central nervous system has the brain which is protected by the cranial cavity. It has three layered connective tissue membranes which are called cranial meninges. Three layers of these meninges are the outer layer which is dura matter, the middle one which is arachnoid matter and the inner one which is pia matter. The forebrain is the anterior part which consists of the cerebellum, the diencephalon which includes the thalamus and the hypothalamus. It is also the largest part of the brain and it has two cerebral hemispheres as you can see in the figure left and right and they are held together by a tract of nerve fibers which are called corpus callosum. The outer part of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. It has convulsions and depressions and is formed of grey matter. The grey colour is because of the presence of neuron cell bodies. The inner part is called the white matter. The cerebral cortex consists of motor area. This motor area will control the voluntary movements of muscles. Then it has the sensory area which controls the functioning of the sense organ. And it also has association area which is neither clearly sensory nor neuter. But it is responsible for intersensory associations, memory and communication. Then all the activities of different centers of the cerebral contact, uh, cortex will control the intelligence, memory, judgment, learning, thinking and articulate speech. So the forebrain includes thalamus which is the structure around which the cerebrum wraps. It is a coordinating center that is it is like a relay station. It will coordinate what information goes where. So it relays the information from sensory and motor impulses. Then we have the hypothalamus which is found below the thalamus. The role of the hypothalamus is to regulate temperature, thirst, hunger and emotions. It also secretes hypothalamic hormones. It controls the pituitary gland and controls sleep, wakefulness, blood pressure and the heart rate of a person. The inner parts of the cerebral hemispheres and a group of associated deep structures like amygdala, hippocampus, the hypothalamus together constitute the limbic system or the limbic lobe. This regulates the sexual behavior the motivations and the emotions that is excitement, pleasure, rage, fear of an individual. Now let us learn about the midbrain. So this is located between the thalamus and pons. A canal passes through the midbrain. It consists of four round lobes called corpora quadrigemina. Their anterior pair is center of the visual reflexes. And the posterior pair is the center for the auditory reflexes, that is what you hear. Then we have the hindbrain, which consists of the cerebrum, pons and medulla oblongata. The midbrain and the hindbrain form the brain stem, this portion. The hindbrain is also called as little cerebrum. It has a very convoluted surface to accommodate more neurons. It coordinates the muscular activity and body's equilibrium. It consists of fiber tracts that interconnect different regions of the brain and coordinates the activities of eye, ear and regulates respiration. The hind brain is connected to the spinal cord. It controls respiration, cardiovascular reflexes, gastric secretion and peristalsis that is the involuntary movement of the muscle. It also contains controls the salivation, vomiting, sneezing and coughing reflexes. Now let us study about spinal cord. So this is enclosed within a spinal canal of the vertebral column. It is also protected by the meninges. It has a central canal containing the 
CSF that is a fluid which is present there. The outer white matter is what forms the outer portion and inside it we have the grey matter. Its function is to conduct the impulses to and from the brain and it is the center for all the spinal reflexes. Now let us look at the peripheral nervous system. So peripheral nervous system will include all the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. The nerve fibers of the peripheral nervous system are of two types. Efferent fibers which carry impulses from the sense organs towards the central nervous system and then we have efferent fibers that is the motor fibers which carry impulses from the central nervous system to the muscles and the glands. So the peripheral nervous system has two divisions as we discussed earlier somatic and autonomic. The somatic neural system releases impulses from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system transmits impulses from CNS to involuntary organs and the smooth muscle. So the ANS has two parts, sympathetic, sympathetic, sympathetic nerves and parasympathetic nerves. It prepares the body to cope with emergency stresses and dangers. It increases the heartbeat and the breathing rate, constricts the arteries and elevates BP. We generally see all these reflexes whenever we are scared or whenever we are very excited. The autonomic nervous system also returns the body to its resting states after a stressful situation. So it slows down the heartbeat, dilates the arteries and lowers the BP. Now, let us look at the peripheral nervous system. All the visceral nervous system is a part of the peripheral nervous system. It includes nerves, fibers, ganglia and the plexus by which the impulses travel from the uh, central nervous system to the viscera and from the viscera to the central nervous system. A ganglion is basically what forms the ganglia. So the ganglion cluster together to form the ganglia. Then we also have something called nerve plexus. So it is basically a branching network of the intersecting nerves. Now let us understand reflex action. Reflex action is a simple, rapid, involuntary, unconscious action of a body in response to a stimulus. It happens immediately and our brain is not really aware of it when it is happening. Various examples of reflex action include certain withdrawal of the hand when it touches a hot object, touching of lips of a nursing baby invokes a sucking reflex, closing of eyelids when light falls on them, knee jerk phenomenon. If a child sees or smells a food unknown to him, he does not salivate. But if he sees or smells that food every time before tasting it, he salivates. So this is an example of conditioned reflex because the child has conditioned his body in such a manner. All these are reflex action phenomena. So one of the major example is knee jerk phenomena. Now if you look at what is common between all of these then we do not do them voluntarily. All this is done involuntarily. That is all this is done without our control. So let us study the reflex arc to understand how does this occur. The pathway of impulses in a reflex action is what is called as reflex arc. So this arc consists of a receptor organ which receives the stimuli. It can be any organ which is able to feel the stimuli like our skin, eye, ear, anything. Then we have a sensory neuron. This neuron transmits the impulses from sense organ to the central nervous system. Then we have the intermediate neuron which connects the sensory and the motor neuron. Then we have the motor neuron which conducts the impulse from the CNS to the effector organ. And then we have the effector organ which responds to the impulse. So this is how a reflex arc is carried out. So suppose we are touching a hot object. At this time our skin receives the stimulus. The sensory neuron takes it forward to the CNS. There is intermediate neuron which relays it to the motor neuron 
the motor neuron conducts the impulse back to the effector organ which is our muscle and the muscle moves the hand away this is how the whole reflex arc will be carried out in the body i hope you all understood this reflex arc properly in the next video we will learn about our sense organs thank you